Good afternoon. Welcome to McMaster Museum of Art. Thanks for joining us today for today's discussion. As we gather, we are reminded that the museum is situated on land that is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga peoples. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this community. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. Today's discussion is presented by Dr. Spencer Pope and two of his students. Dr. Pope is an associate professor in the Department of Classics at McMaster University. He's also the director of the Center for Ancient Numismatics, Faculty of Humanities at the university, as well as the honorary curator of numismatics and antiquities at the museum. Dr. Pope's uh, areas of research and interest are Greek archeology, span Greek colonization, ancient urbanism and architecture, and Greek numismatics. I'll turn it over now to Dr. Pope to introduce the students and to lead the discussion. Thank you very much, Carol. I want to start by thanking you and the McMaster Museum of Art for the privilege of speaking here today. For those who don't know, under Carol's leadership, the museum continues to thrive despite upheavals of the COVID pandemic and continues to be a strong voice for positive change. I'm grateful also to, to Sam DeLang for his efforts in making the talk and, and the material presented here available and to Elise Vickers for her tireless work in making all of this look good. I wanna thank my co-speakers who have dedicated time during the semester to this forum. And one more thanks to Julie Bronson who has dedicated numerous hours to the antiquities and numismatic collection at the museum in general. And none of this would have been possible without her. With that, I will begin to share my screen. And think about ancient coinage. The talk today accompanying the upcoming exhibition in the McMaster Museum of Art serial production invites you to consider the materiality and coming into being of coins and other categories of ancient Mediterranean material culture. We often associate this time and place with monuments such as the Parthenon seen here with individually carved sculpture in marble. Transforming a block of marble into a piece of sculpture requires the removal and smoothing of stone and even if one were to use a, a pointing tool or template to facilitate the work, the process must be repeated from the start for each example. So in this way, the first and the last of the nearly identical karyotids from the Athenian Acropolis each required just as much person power as the next. Pottery and vase painting had similar processes Hand-thrown paints were uh, hand-thrown pots were then painted by hand. There were no shortcuts to the production. Bronze sculpture produced in the lost wax techniques are also one-offs, as the molds were often broken during the process, and so they're ultimately unique objects. But there were more extended productions in the ancient world. Terracotta molds were used with clay to produce small scale figurines like the one seen on the slide or lamps like the Roman lamp seen on the slide from the McMaster Museum of Art collection. Molds could also be used for bronze figurines and if the mold was in stone it may be used multiple times others were lost in the process. For both bronze and terracotta it is possible to identify examples coming from the same matrices or sibling figures since the figurines were often used as religious offerings, similar types were convenient as objects pur purchased by different dedicants visiting a sanctuary. That's sort of indications of what should be offered and where it should be placed through their similarity. And with this, they may have 
helped commerce of votive goods and encouraged worship of the deities. But strictly speaking, the utility of the terracottas was not intrinsically tied to their unity in form. It's worth another category of material culture that an identical appearance is a feature, not a bug nor a concomitant attribute. And that is with coinage. Would you use this coin, Canada Z dollared? Probably not, right? If it's not recognizable, it, it's less likely to be accepted. The coin's recognizability is principal to its function, which means that thousands or even millions of identical objects were needed to supply both the ancient and modern cities and states with numismatic output, with coins. Well, today coins are stamped and milled for a perfectly uniform look. In antiquity, they were struck from dyes and therein represent a unique manufacturing process that approached mass production and which is neither <clears throat> creating an original nor a copy but only members of a series falling in sequence. Their serial production is essential to their function as coinage and satisfies the needs both for nearly identical objects used by the community and for expedient production at a grand scale. Tools to create coins in antiquity included two engraved dies. And you can see on the, the diagram how they're arranged, a lower or obverse die was embedded in a solid base such as an anvil and an upper or reverse die secured into the punch, which absorbed the blow directly from the hammer. Blanks for the ancient coins were commonly cast as pellets and sometimes are called flans. And they were made malleable by heating before striking. And the striking was a single moment, a single operation that left an impression on both sides of the blank, which therein had been transformed into a coin. Very few dyes themselves survived from antiquity, but most were likely made of hardened bronze or more likely iron. It has been estimated that dyes could produce up to 20,000 pieces, but the median use was certainly lower than this and may have been closer to 5,000 per dye. The upper or reverse dye tended to have a shorter life than the lower or obverse since they received the direct impact from the hammer. Dye engraving is artistically and technically most similar to gem engraving, and it is likely that the same artist worked in both media. Engraved cylinder seals are comparable in size and composition, and when rolled out onto clay tablets, they functioned as signatures for the owners in the same way that coins acted as identifiers for the communities. Coins were likely produced in quick succession and variables in the process kept each member of the series from being truly identical. An imperfect strike, an imperfect strike might leave a portion of the image off center as seen here in an example from the McMaster Museum of Art or a double or triple strike on the flan can leave distinctive traces. And if you look at the chin of Athena, we can see sort of a ghost image. This is the result of a double strike. Other variations could occur during the striking process. If the metal, in this case silver, had cooled a little bit too much, the, the strike could cause a crack like in the Athena for, again, in an example from the McMaster Museum of Art. Broadly speaking, the flans were designed to be the same size and shape, but variations did occur based on the, the molds and the, the pouring of the molten metal. As the value of the coin is tied to the quantity of precious metals, in theory, all coins of the same denomination should weigh exactly the same, and any variation thereof would lead to preferring one versus the other, maybe hoarding of those slightly overweight and trying to spend as quickly as possible while those a little bit underweight. In practice, it does seem that weights did fluctuate and eventually 
both in the Greek and Roman worlds, their weights were manipulated to create a fiduciary value greater than the intrinsic value of the metal so that the exact precise weight of the coin became less of a concern moving forward and the value marked on the, on the coin, the stamp of value on the coin became the real determiner of value. And we can see the extension of this process today with our present currency. The example seen here, the, the $20 banknote has a fiduciary value of $20. We know them, we spend them, we get them out of the ATM. And we can be certain that there in no way is there $20 worth of paper or plastic in this banknote. It is the assigned or fiduciary value that we use rather the, than the intrinsic value of the material itself. In the ancient world, the right to mint was usually reserved for the polis. And correspondingly, it is frequently the single origin of coins in a community. Although a little bit later today, we'll hear about other bodies that issued coins. The rhythm of production is more easily reconstructed for large outputs from cities such as Athens and for periods such as the fifth century BCE. At this moment of uh, of excellence and expansion of the Athenian city, the mint required a small team responsible for melting and casting and likely a separate team for striking. This could be a, a, a group anywhere from 30 to 100 individuals. In the middle years of the fifth century, Athens produced between one and nine million coins a year. And it, if, each die produced up to 20,000 coins, that means they were consuming as many as 450 dyes a year. That's more than one die per day. And we can imagine with a rhythm of striking, loading the flan, striking, moving the flan, reloading it, striking again, the production was limited perhaps by the coordination of the, off of the office and the arm strength of the striker. It is possible to see different denominations struck at the same time. That is coins of different size and different type being produced adjacent to one another as they would not share equipment or, uh, you know, or be supplied by the, the same set of flans. Athens in, from the fifth century produced coins in a range of denominations. The base unit was the drachma at 4.3 grams, which we can eventually peg about a day's wage. It's an imperfect comparison, but it gives us a sort of a ballpark uh, understanding of the value of the coin. And multiples of that, including the the didram two, the tetradram four, and even the decadram, the 10 drachma coin were used as big bills. The drachma was also split into fractions and the conventional division is into sixths called obols. And on the screen, we can see a tetradram from the McMaster Museum of Art, as well as an obol. And I'll draw your attention to the fact that the oval is 8.7 millimeters wide. And uh, with this, it, it risks getting lost in, in one's purse or uh, on one's person. And even amazing to think that this small coin weighing just 0.58 grams was not the smallest denomination. And, and in fact, the the smallest known is the Heme Tetarte Morion, or 1 48th of a drachma weighing just 0 0.09 grams. Minting these small coins must have been more a work of precision than a brute force. Eventually, even smaller denominations became desirable, and bronze coins with an intrinsic value of approximately 1 100th of that of silver were produced. Ron coins were generally bigger and heavier and with this a little bit more manageable and that larger size gave a larger field for images and types and, and uh, portraits. 
and uh, with a, a, a more effective medium for communicating identity to the community with a bimetallic system that included silver and bronze, it, it, Athenians had a denomination for every purpose. The decadrams and tetradrams were stored under the mattress, sometimes paid in as taxes by rich individuals, while small fractions like the obol and its divisions were used for buying a loaf of bread in the market on a regular basis. Telling the story of the production of coins may also be done through object biographies. Gold and silver were sourced from a number of locations in the Mediterranean region, and gold, silver, as well as copper and tin had been mined for millennia, going all the way back to the fourth millennium BCE, but technological developments and advancing knowledge of the natural world supported the expanded removal of ores. Taken together with the fact that the advent of coinage fueled only the desire for more coinage, the number and complexity of mines increased significantly from say about 500 BCE. Broadly speaking, ores were one of the principal drivers for Mediterranean-wide trade as central Italy, Sardinia, and the Iberian Peninsula were exploited for the resources. Phoenician ships traded for gold, silver, and copper, as well as lead in modern Spain. A principal source was the site Rio Tinto in Andalusia, a site later known as Bebelo and discussed in Pliny's Natural Histories. This was a locus for silver for the Roman Empire and an area of intense activity that included aqueducts set up specifically to feed the, the mining facilities. Electrum, a naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver was mined from the Pactolos River running through Lydia in Anatolia. And the abundance of this metal in the region is undoubtedly linked to the appearance of the earliest coinages or is a coinage slightly before 600 BCE. Cyprus was a principal source for copper going all the way back to the Bronze Age, and gold was extracted from the Balkan Peninsula in the Roman period, as well as in, in, in Roman extraction occurred in the Black Sea region for both gold and silver. In the Aegean, mines on the islands of Thassos and Seafnos supplied silver in the Archaic period, but it's near Athens in a region called Attica, just kilometers from the, the city of Athens itself, that the best known mine from antiquity is located. This is Laurion, and even the playwright Aeschylus referred to the mines here as a fountain of silver, a treasure in the soil. And with this, there's little doubt that this natural deposit radically changed the direction of the city's economy. It was generally understood that silver extracted at Lorient was publicly owned, although there is no broad evidence to support this. The silver must have been conceptualized as a public good and taken through a type of eminent domain. And it does seem to be mine operations that were state owned, but we have even more evidence, including epigraphic evidence for operators buying access. In Aristotle's Constitution of Athens, the state sells the right to collect income from the mine, but at the same time, the state also rents public property to mine operators. In this case, it seems that the operator of the mine was recognized as the owner of the output. They got to take the silver away, but the price for that was the, the contract paid to the city. And in this way, Athens, for example, would receive income both from the renting of the land, but also through taxes on the silver that came out of them. The amount taken by the state is not entirely clear and different pieces of evidence point us in different directions. One contract seems to indicate as little as 150 drachma a year. Again, you know, uh, one, one drachma is one day's wage. Uh, other sources 
indicate rent was 2,000 or 9,000 drachmae, which may be more reasonable sums. A late source called the Suda indicates a tax was 1 24th of the, the silver coming out, which would be about 4.17%, which in today's standard seems rather small, but if for a fledgling Athenian state in the archaic period, this may have been a substantial percentage of revenue. Extraction was difficult work, and we could imagine that extant metals could be conveniently melted down to produce new coins. This is something we hold generally to be true, and archaeologically we can see evidence of overstriking and coins uh, transform from holding one type to another. But more broadly speaking, there's little epigraphic or historical evidence for this practice on a large scale. The, the best attested occurrence occur is from 407 BCE when Athens fighting wars that it was struggling to finance, decided to melt down golden statues of Nike or a winged victory to produce some 84,000 gold coins. And in addition to this, there is a reference from the Greek historian Thucydides that the 40 talents of gold held on the statue of Athena Parthenos in the Parthenon could be removed and melted down to create coins. And with this, he, he tried to bolster the city, uh, in, informing them of resources that uh, could be employed and uh, ways forward for the Athenian state. There's no evidence that the metal was ever melted down, uh, but it does give it an interesting uh, insight into the Greek mind about the degree of fungibility between works of art and tokens of exchange that uh, the, even the, the beautiful and intricately wrought Athena here seen in a reconstruction from Nashville, Tennessee could end up paying soldiers is uh, you know, quite a long way for the material to go. Turning to the Roman world, Central Italy favored bronze as a medium of exchange and unfinished lumps of bronze known as ice rude were the first form of tradable wealth. Rome later produced heavy cast coins, so not struck, but cast coins called ice grave and literally it just means heavy bronze. These were introduced in the third century BCE and the McMaster Museum of Art has one example of the ice grave seen here in the slide in front of you. These coins included depictions of Roman deities on the obverse and value markers on the reverse. This is a half pound coin, and we can see the two dots indicate two are needed to make one pound, and with this, you know, the, the fraction one of two. And the ice grave had halves, thirds, and quarters. The ice grave includes a depiction of Roman deities on the obverse and a prow, uh, the, the forepart of the, the Roman ship on the reverse. In an attempt to create a system that permitted the use of both bronze and silver, the weight of the bronzes decreased gradually, which means the size of the coin decreased along with it. And eventually the coins it, it reached a size that allowed them to be struck rather than cast. But it wasn't until the, the Second Punic War and the year 212 BCE that under great strain, Rome reformed its monetary system and developed a new coin, the denarius. This was a, a 10 pound coin, but in, it struck in silver, uh, the, the, actual, uh, the actual weight of the coin is just a few grams. It's uh, 10 pounds. 
owned is the fiduciary or assigned value of the coin. On the Ombres was the head of Roma, the personification of the city. And the reverses included a range of different types. And we can see again, three from the collection with uh, chariots being pulled by horses, sea creatures sort of meandering underneath. And uh, again, it, uh, across the centuries in which the denarii were created, we see that there are elements in common that it assure their recognizability as currency. Athena in, in majestic profile view appears quite frequently. With the reformation in the early third century, the Roman state instituted new offices to oversee the production of coinage and essentially a, a department of the treasury. The magistrates were known as the tres viri monetales, or tres viri are argento auro flando feriundo, the three person board responsible for striking bronze, silver, and gold. They take their name, tres viri monetales, from the mint's location near the temple of Juno Moneta on the Capitoline Hill in this, the center of Rome. So isn't this fascinating that our term, even money uh, deriving from the Latin term, eventually doesn't refer to coins themselves, but refers to the temple near the mint, the temple of Juno Moneta or Juno the protector. Moving across the Roman Republican period, the aspirations of the ruling class began to overshadow the civic manifestations on coinage and effectively supplanted them through growing references to their own clan. Person began to take precedence over the community. And with this, a, a variety of types it emerged, including uh, it, 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 it coins with the names of the moneyers themselves appearing on them. Placing a name on a coin or using the, the name of an authority is something that goes back at least to the fifth century and certainly not uncommon, particularly in kingdoms with one single ruler. And as an example of this, I'm gonna dip back into the Greek world and look at a Macedonian coin. This is actually minted under the King Cassander, but it includes the venerable name of his predecessor, Alexander. And I think we can see nicely on the coin written in the Greek alphabet, Alexandru, and uh, with this, the, the name of the king adorning coinage. But just as significantly, there are other examples of magistrates, not rulers, but bureaucrats who put their name on coinage. And from Athens in the second century BCE, we can see actually abbreviations of a number of names. Athe, red on either side of the owl's head, is the abbreviation of the city, but Aro, Po, Mina, Sa, Go, Nico are all, all abbreviations for minting officials who were in charge. And, and here they did not uh, neglect to take up the opportunity to put their own names on the coin and take a little bit of credit for the object circulating. In another coin from the McMaster Museum of Art, a tetra oval of Argos, the wolf is on the obverse and on the reverse, an A for Argos or Alpha for Argos is surrounded by smaller letters spelling out Agathocleos, who we deduce is a magistrate who again was, must have been in charge of minting and took the opportunity to promote himself. And, and of course, we see this tradition picked up in the Roman imperial period here, with the, the advent of the Roman Empire, the obverse side of the coin provided 
just too significant, just too prominent and uh, too enticing to leave to the gods above. So Augustus, the first emperor, placed his own portrait on the coin. And with this established a tradition that is still visible today because Augustus did it is why Queen Elizabeth is on our Canadian coinage. There's a direct line from one to the next. Within that process, the, the more immediate successors to uh, Augustus uh, present a, a real uh, fascinating study in self-representation. We'll hear a, a little bit more about one of them and a particular fascinating emperor, Nero, in, in just a few moments. So maybe uh, it's sufficient that I add only that the portraits are veristic and accurately re represent the ruler, but at the same time, their profiles all esteem the, their authority and dignify the currency. Following the precedent set by Augustus, the Roman imperial monetary system continued with little change for the subsequent three centuries. Response to moments of economic crisis was to reduce the frequency of the percentage of metal content of the coinage. And uh, Nero, as he nearly bankrupt the, the empire, reduced the gold content of the aureus by four and a half percent and the silver content of the denarius by 11%. And with these reductions, there was a greater split between the fiduciary fiat or uh, established value of the coin and the intrinsic value of the metal used to produce the coin. And with this, there's greater dependence on the role of the authority backing the monetary system. If those controlling the, the, the system aren't concerned about the reduction, well, then we as users or members of the community are more likely to continue to use the coins despite their content. These were early but crucial steps that still resonate today as we operate in a society with fiduciary notes. What is more, the last few decades have accelerated the, let's call it dematerialization of currency. For many of us, our life savings are just numbers on a screen that are backed by faith in a system that uh, there's something tangible, there's something real to those numbers we look at. The advent of completely digital currency, such as Bitcoin, it takes this concept even further. Rather than supported by a polis, a king, an, an empire, or any sort of uh, actual physical community, there is assurance, the, the guarantor of the validity of the, the Bitcoin seems to come from blockchain and faith that the algorithms that govern their extraction will be held true and that the number of Bitcoin available will grow as anticipated. And with this, the, the value is not likely to change radically. But it, 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 ultimately, it is up to the market and the belief in the value of the object that governs it, its worth. What makes Bitcoin valuable? Only the possibility that others will see it of similar or even greater value Otherwise, it's in, in something not worth investing in and a, in a failed attempt at a monetary system. But thinking about the use and, and potential adoption of cryptocurrencies, is it really that strange that the assigned value of this sort of nationless, directorless, anonymous electronic coinage is, is more logical, more sensible than assigning great worth just to shiny rocks that are extracted from the ground and, and impress individuals and uh, with this made valuable. What made gold and silver the, the standard appearance, prestige, presence, and there's no reason that that those same aspects can't be transferred to other media.
with this, I'll thank you for your attention and introduce the rest of the panel that will be speaking with the group today. First, I'd like to introduce Cassius Di Maria, an MA student in the Department of Classics at McMaster University. And I would like to add soon to be PhD student in the Department of Classics. His thesis looks at federal coinage in the Greek world, and he'll be talking uh, about bodies other than the polis that produce coinage. Let me stop sharing. <laughs> and you should be able to share, Cassius. Perfect. All right. So like Dr. Pope said, today I'm gonna to be talking about the coinage that was minted by federal states in the ancient Greek world. So before I start with that, I'm just gonna quickly define what a federal state is. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines a modern federal state as a country consisting of a group of individual states that have control over their own affairs, but are controlled by a central government for national decisions. And the same is true in the ancient world. Um, made up of these smaller city-states, because we tend to think of the autonomous city-state when we think of ancient Greece. However, by the late fourth century BC, nearly half of these city-states were members of a federal state, or often we call them leagues. Some of the leagues best attested in the literary and epigraphic evidence from this time are the Achaean League, the Aetolian League, and the Boeotian League. We have leagues in, well, we have federal states in the modern world. We don't usually call them leagues anymore but the United States of America, Australia, and Canada all also function as a federal state. There are a lot of benefits to having a federalism as a form of government, military, economic, et cetera. Obviously we're talking about coins. I'm gonna be focusing on these economic benefits. When these states formed the federations, they usually took steps to encourage trade between member states, improving what we can call the citizens economic mobility by doing things like removing import and export fees and allowing citizens of one member state to purchase property in another. Usually you would have to be a citizen of a city state to do this. But there was a major barrier to this between city states in the ancient world. Now Xenophon was an ancient Greek philosopher and historian writing in the early to mid fourth century. And he had this to say about the coinage in city states. For the merchants in most cities are forced to take anything as a return cargo for their coinage is declared not usable outside of their own state. So he was specifically referring to how Athenian coinage like Dr. Pope mentioned it, he was talking about from Laureon the silver had a good reputation so in cities other than Athens people didn't like to use the coins outside of those city states so he's acknowledging the issues which arise from the disparate currencies used between states, and this can be an issue for merchants. Those who travel to sell goods probably don't want to be paid in money that they can only use in one city. So the majority of federations implemented the same solution to this problem. So the implementation of a standard unified currency across all member states removes this as an economic barrier and serves to promote interpolis trade within the federation. We have several coins from these federations at the MMA. So here is a coin from the Thessalian League, as you can see, this is one of the ones we have in our collection. And this is one from the Achaean League. As I mentioned, the Achaean League is one of the ones better attested in the literary and epigraphic evidence. So these coins from these leagues would typically be minted on the same standard. They would usually have the same image on both the obverse and the reverse, and only a very small indication on them to tell you which city in the league had minted them. So for the most part, they would all look exactly the same. And then you could use them in the various cities of the league without having to worry about going to see a money changer every time you went to a different city, which could be time consuming and they would take a fee. 
Now we have unified coinage in the modern world as well, not just in the federal states uh, I mentioned, Canada, America, et cetera. Obviously we have our federal currency, but consider also that the EU has a unified coinage. This is why I had a little asterisk next to the all member states, because recall not every member of the EU chose to implement the Euro. So there are exceptions. Now, because so many of these federations minted these kinds of coins, they actually can serve as evidence for federal states that are maybe less represented in the literary or epigraphic sources. Coins make excellent evidence for a number of reasons. They were mass produced, as Dr. Pope said, all on the same standard. So we have this large amount of these things made which makes it more likely that they would survive to us to the modern day, especially because coins are made of metal. They're relatively durable. The images can and do get worn off. We have the coins we're showing you today are in very good condition. That cannot be said for all coins from the ancient world. And some are very difficult to read. But for the most part, they're a lot more likely to survive than the paper money we're using today, which will all but vanish in the same amount of time that these coins survived to us over. And finally, coins were often purposefully collected and buried so that the owner could go back and find them later. And we call these coin hoards. So it is sometimes you will just find 2,000, 3,000 coins buried in a jar in a field. Now, I mentioned that the Achaean, Aetolian, and Boeotian leagues are well represented in the evidence. But what about leagues that aren't? The Euboean League was an alliance between the major city-states on the Greek island of Euboea, shown in red here on this map. This league is so poorly attested in the literature that scholars, many scholars question, if not its existence, its significance. There are large periods of time where it vanishes entirely from basically every source, except one. The Euboean League was consistently producing coins including in these time periods where, according to every other source, it shouldn't have existed. You'll see on your screen a coin of the Euboean League. Um, it features Euboea, a nymph, on one side, and on the other side it features the head of a cow or sometimes a full body of a cow, and then we'll say Euboea somewhere in the legend. So even though the evidence outside of numismatics tells us that this this federation didn't exist most of the time and was a loose alliance at best, not particularly organized. The minting of these coins from the four main city states in Euboea, all of which did produce these coins, um, tells us that it did have a higher level of organization than the literary sources would have us believe. Now, the Euboean League is just one example of how coins can be used as evidence to help fill these potential gaps in the more traditional historical sources. And while they can't tell us the whole story, they can provide insight into the political and economic landscape at the time they were struck. So thank you. And Dr. Pope, if you're speaking, you are still muted. Thank you, Cassius. Thank you for reminding me I was muted. Uh, I, our third panelist, is Melissa Cholinuk, a MA student in the Department of Classics at McMaster and a Roman archeologist who is examining the coinage of Nero. I'll turn things over to you, Melissa. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there we go. Hope everyone can see my screen. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so my presentation is on the lost temple of Janus. The temple of Janus or the twin door shrine is one of the most important temples in Rome and is recognizable for its double doors. The doors themselves had an important function. Whenever Rome was at war, the doors to the temple would be opened. And whenever peace was finally brought to Rome, the doors of the temple would then be shut. This can poetically be seen within book one of the Aeneid in which Virgil describes the closing of their doors when peace is finally achieved. War is at an end and grim with iron frames, the gates of war will then be shut. Unfortunately, this temple is lost as there are no remains left, nor has it ever been officially uncovered. 
And although the depiction of the temple on Nerodian coins is fascinating and unique, it has not been sufficiently exploited despite how important this numismatic evidence is in our understanding of the temple. Especially since these Neronian coins are the only physical depiction we have left of the Temple of Janus, since again, the temple is lost and there are no other contemporary depictions of the temple. The Neronian coins that depict the Temple of Janus are therefore an important link to the lost Temple of Janus and will pave the way for a greater understanding and reflection of something once lost. From my study, I hope that these coins will be utilized to their fullest potential and help in our understanding of this lost Roman monument. The only ancient source that gives a description of the temple is Procopius, who gives a small description of the temple when he visited Rome during 535 CE. However, even though Procopius gives us, this, gives us a description of the temple, there is of course the question of whether or not Procopius even went to Rome and observed the temple that he is describing, or even if the temple was still standing during that time as this temple was destroyed many times throughout its history, and we do not know for certain when its final destruction occurred. The numismatic evidence is then the best evidence we have as it reflects the appearance of the temple during a time when it was not only in use, but was also still standing as it was actively being used before, after, and at that time. And again, Nero did close the doors to the temple and it occurs, and it most likely coincides with its appearance upon its coinage. So it was actively being used at that time. However, these Neronian coins occurred at different, at different times and at two different locations. So both at Rome and Lugdunum. Therefore, some depictions of the temple may be less accurate and may have incurred many changes over time. Uh, the McMaster Museum of Art actually holds one of these coins, which can be seen on this slide. Uh, so for my research, I focus on analyzing the dyes that bear the Temple of Janus. A die is, engra is an engraved piece of metal used during the process of striking a coin. I will use the images found on the dies in order to find the master die or the first coin created that bore the image of the Temple of Janus. This is because it has been observed that the earliest coins are more carefully cut and are more detailed than the later ones. This means that the master dies, which are again the original or first coins produced, are the most accurate representation of the monument which they are emulating. In order to find these coins, I have been attempting to find an approximate order of striking for those dies. Uh, this ultimately allows me to theoretically see what the earliest dies would have been based on their, upon their location and the approximate sequence. So if they occur earlier on in the sequence, they're most likely more accurate than those which occur later on. As you can see in the beginning or on the coin located to the far left, the overall st structure of the temple is elongated, uh, somewhat symmetrical and proportional and very detailed with many decorations or overall more effort put into it by the die engravers in an overall attempt to make the coin accurately reflect the side of the temple. Uh, this can especially be seen in the first photo since it is almost as if they tried to emulate the depth of the columns that you would see when viewing the temple from the side. I think you can see my mouse right there. So located on the left side of the door frame, there are three vertical lines. This unique feature sets these eyes apart from others since it seems as though the engraver is trying to capture the complex nature of the columns located on either side of the door frame. So they're clearly attempting to capture a more realistic view of the column, the temple from the viewpoint of an onlooker of the actual temple, and therefore a more accurate architectural depiction of the temple. Uh, you can also see the progression of changes made to the temple on the window. The first image to the left, to the left has, a very, has very large dimensions with a width of three and a length of nine. The next has a width of two and a length of seven. And the last coin on the right has much smaller dimensions with a, a width of two and a length of only five. Uh, the first two coins are also very detailed as they have a lot of care taken on them in order to reflect, again, a more accurate or more detailed reflection of the temple. You can especially see this on coin number two uh, with the door frame. It's much more detailed. Uh, so its appearance over time is as though there's an overall simplification and easier appearance to the temple towards the end of the sequence. Uh, so overall, the first has a unique uh, feature. The second has a highly embellished door frame. And then the last coin shows a temple that is very much simplified and unproportional. As you can especially compare the second coin to the third coin and the door front. Notice how on the last coin, there's only really two large door handles. That's their embellished feature compared to the second door front, which is much more embellished. Uh, but using my observations and my identified earlier coins, I will attempt to reconstruct the lost temple of Janus by using the numismatic evidence, since this is the only accurate contemporary depiction of the temple that survived. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Melissa. And thank you, uh, Cassius, as well. You've given us a, a lot to think about and it's wonderful to see 
your research related to coinage and even the employment of coins from the McMaster Museum of Art in your MA theses. We do have some time and I would love to open up the, the floor to questions. There is a Q&A box uh, they can be accessed from the bottom of the screen and would be happy to field questions coming in from anyone out there. So I have a, a question right away asking about the survival rate of the obol and its subdivisions. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as you can imagine, it, it's very small and you know, we can imagine uh, you know, substantial production and, you know, numbers commensurate with the tetradrams and, and didrams produced in Athens across the, the fifth century. So, you know, looking at originally millions of, of issues and it's, and, and, you know, due to their small size that they escape the notice of, of and, both excavators and uh, in, in other contexts. So I, I can't give a precise number, but you know, it, it is uh, very, very small and we have fewer examples of those than their larger cousins. Uh, this is, it, it, maybe I'll, I'll pivot and say, you know, this is uh, exactly why anyone that has the privilege of excavating needs to go through their their backfill with a sieve and use a a fine dimension sieve on all the soil so you, you can be certain that you're not uh, you know just dumping coins that uh, are too small to you know, to to make your nurse I hope that answers your question at 0 0.09 grams, we can understand the, the complexity of, of managing them. And, and even there's a joke in, in Aristophanes about uh, choking on your coins. And so with that, we think they're, they might've been kept in the mouth uh, as a, a way it, not for them to be lost. And I see a question for Cassius. Cassius, how centralized do you think we should see the minting of the various leagues? Does the minting concentrate in various cities or is it more dispersed? Um, it really seems to depend on which league you're talking about. I know in the bigger league, like in Acha the Achaean League, for example, which is the one that I'm the most familiar with the federal coins coming from, they seem to have come from the cities that also minted the most of their own coinage as well. So you have a few big cities that do the majority of the contributions and it seems to be the bigger cities in the league as well. And they usually put like a little symbol of some variety on the coin to let you know which city mint it came from. And then when you have some of the smaller leagues, like I think the Thessalian League, most of their coins seem to come from just one of the mints. So it really is depends. The, federate, the federal states are all different. They don't all operate the same way. So it depends which one you're looking at. Thank you. There's a, a question for Melissa regarding the temple. Uh, first is, is it seem to be the case that the closing of the doors by Nero was the occasion for placing the, the temple on coinage and it did, did other emperors place this temple on their coinage. And a follow-up to that, asking a, about the perspective view, is that sort of standard for depictions of architecture on coinage? Oh, that's a lot. Uh, I think your first question on if it coincides, it most likely coincides. I have read an article that actually discusses whether or not it actually coincides with his closure of the temple. Uh, so his defeat, Nero defeated the Parthians in 64. Uh, it has been theorized that it coincides because the coins were struck from 64 to slash 65 to 67 slash 68. Uh, unfortunately, Tacitus and Suetonius, who both mentioned this closure, 
uh, kind of disagree with one another. Some suggest that it was actually closed in 66. And so the coins actually were perhaps uh, looking to the future and kind of uh, looking to the future of the closure. So it didn't actually coincide. Uh, I think most agree that it did occur in 64 and that the closure did occur in, also in 64, but there is kind of a debate. I've read one article on this as well, uh, on that topic. Oh, what is this? Uh, the second question I think was perspectives. I didn't show them on this slide, but there are. So uh, for my research, I'm looking at the sister she, and there are two representations of the temple. I think I showed you temple facing left, and there's also temple facing right, which is, uh, much more smaller quantity. There's much more of temple facing, wait, tem temple facing right <laughs> than kind of temple facing left uh, on other coins because there are multiple, of course, versions of this coin. Um, I think of the denarii. Uh, anyway, there are versions where it actually is front facing. So you have temple right, temple left, and also front facing. Uh, there's actually a theory that when they were producing the dies, so the master die engravers, uh, they per perhaps were looking at a 3D model. And that's perhaps why we have these different angles. So we have temple facing right, left, and uh, center. Uh, as for the question of, are there any other coins? No, Nero is the only person to put the Temple of Janus on his coinage. And it's interesting because Augustus himself claimed to have closed the temples, to the doors of the temple three times. He even mentions it in his Regusti. Uh, but Nero is the only one to actually depict it on his temple. That's very, that's actually what kind of struck my interest is why does Nero choose to put it on his coin? Why is he the only one? He of course wasn't the only one to close the doors to the temple. Uh, was there a third question or? <laughs> No, I think you you hit all of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. That was a great question. There's one, you know, this topic continues to fascinate. And one more question: Do you believe that the if, if, uh, for you, Melissa, about the, the temple? Do you believe the simplification of the design was motivated by the need to increase the lifespan of the die? That is, you know, the the more complex the die, the more likely it is to fail earlier than later. That is an excellent question. I think, uh, so the first coins that were created were created by the master die engravers. So it would be the most accurate depiction of the temple uh, throughout the production. So the first coin created arc is again created by these master die engravers. You don't have that. The master die engravers created the first dies. And so as it's being produced, they kind of, so to speak, they kind of grow lazy. They tweak it themselves. They're not having, they're not consulting the master die anymore. And that's kind of, that's really what accounts for this oversimplification is they kind of are growing lazy throughout the production of the coin. You do see this oversimplification. They're not looking at the master die engraver and kind of trying to copy it. They're kind of just, oh, we broke a die, I'm just gonna quickly make another one. Um, that, does that answer the question? No, that, I think so. I think we we can maybe squeeze in one more question. There's a, a, a question about other bodies that issued coins beyond federations. And I'll, I'll mention quickly that we know mercenary groups tended to issue coins and uh, you know the, is that a, a payment was made sort of by a leader and coins were distributed to each member of the band. And with this sort of another uh, coinage from a body other than a state and from a respected, but far from, let's say official authority. I think with it, we'll, that takes us just about to the end of the hour. So maybe it, could uh, ask him to, to thank once again our speakers, uh, the panel with Cassius and Melissa. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for taking your, the, the time today to partake in the discussion. Uh, it is wonderful to see uh, this activity uh, at the museum and you know, th this connection between the museum and academic research at McMaster. So thank you all for attending. And I hope to see you in the museum at some point in person soon.